And all right, welcome everybody. So happy that you joined us today. And today we are here for a presentation about indigenous women of Alcatraz and the Red Power Movement. Very exciting. Um, and we wanna welcome you to the unceded land of the Ohlone tribal people and acknowledge the many Ramutish Ohlone family groups and tribal groups as the rightful stewards in the lands in which we work and reside here in the Bay Area. SFPL is encouraged, uh, encourages you to learn more about tribal culture, land rights, and first person culture. We also um, provide lots of book lists about this and we are committed to hosting events like this and spreading this information and factual information and standing in solidarity. We also want to acknowledge uh, Black Lives Matter and let folks know we do stand in solidarity with that as well, with that movement and towards ending systemic racism. Our library is not a neutral institution, which I am very proud of. And we are working towards this. Um, lots of work to do, obviously. Um, my name is Anissa Malady. I am a librarian at San Francisco Public Library working on programming um, in our virtual space now. So again, I appreciate you joining us here and working through all of the technical side of things. Um, it's always an interesting challenge in the online world. So what will happen now is I will, um, I introduce myself, I will send a follow-up document to everybody. I also put a link in the chat. Uh, lots of things come up during the programs that we'll talk about. Um, and um, quickly, just some upcoming programs are October, I mean, sorry, our August uh, author of the month is Virgil Tovar. Um, we have a book club coming up about Citizen. It's a, a social justice uh, anti-racism book club. Encourage you to join us for that. I, we encourage you just to check out our webpage for lots of information. Um, something very important is that you take your census. Please tell everybody to tell everybody to take your census. It has now been cut by a month and I just I predicted it was gonna happen. It is so important. California could lose a seat in the House of Representatives if we don't get a, a full count. And we are only at 37% count right now. So, so many people need to make this happen. Everyone in your household counts, babies count. So please, and don't be afraid. It has nothing to do with any kind of, you know, I know it's the government, people do get afraid, but please try and overlook all that for, for one second. Um, it takes nine minutes, it's really quick. And it also brings $20,000 per count into our community. Um, if you didn't know, we finally launched or launching our library to go so you can have hands free pickup. It's happening finally, finally. Coming up in September and October, we'll be celebrating Viva Latinx Heritage Month. Very exciting about that. Lots of great programs. So stick around. Um, definite PSA here. Please continue to wear your masks. And you know, it's not about you, it's about everybody else, right? And the city does offer free COVID testing, sf.gov slash city test sf. And it's super quick, got my test in one day. Um, Zoom housekeeping and um, please place your questions and answers in the box and we'll get them from there. And we can chat as we go. And like I said, I'll be creating a document of all these resources. And this resource list also contains a lot of stuff about um, native culture and some great uh, websites that we use and some other great, great info. And I wanna give a special thanks to our friends of the library who helped promote all these wonderful things we do. And I wanna turn it back over to Steve who I forgot a little bit, just a little bit, Steve. Tell us about NPS. Hi, everybody. I'm Stephen Cody, and I'm the acting site supervisor for the National Park Service on Alcatraz Island and the curator of the special exhibition, Red Power on Alcatraz Perspectives 50 Years Later. 
On behalf of the National Park Service and the Golden Gate National Recreation Area, welcome to this presentation, which is part of the Alcatraz Second Saturday Cultural Events, hosted by our friends and partners there at the San Francisco Public Library. Thank you so much, Anissa, for all you guys do. Today's event continues the commemoration of the ongoing 50th anniversary of the occupation of Alcatraz Island by the Indians of all tribes, which sparked a movement for Native American dignity, rights, and justice. The National Park Service is committed to telling the story of America's history and our sometimes difficult legacy of working toward a more equal and just society through the preservation and interpretation of historic sites around the country such as Manzanar, Port Chicago, Stonewall, and Alcatraz. Inspired by the hopes of the original occupiers to build a Native American cultural center on Alcatraz, the second Saturday series of cultural events seeks to highlight Native American voices and cultures. The second Saturday series is a, a central piece to the special exhibition, Red Power on Alcatraz, Perspectives 50 Years Later. During the public health closure of Alcatraz, much of this exhibit has been uploaded to the, to the National Park Service Alcatraz Red Power 50 website and can be viewed online. Today's event highlights the role of indigenous women during the occupation and the Red Power movement with a conversation moderated by original occupier and founding member of the Indians of All Tribes, Dr. Lenata Warjack. Uh, I'm also very excited to announce the first phase of the Alcatraz reopening plan on August 17th. A limited number of visitors will be able to visit the island for an outdoor only experience. For more information and tickets, visit the Alcatraz Cruises website. That's Alcatraz Cruises. The National Park Service thanks the panelists, the viewers, and the San Francisco Public Library for participating in this event. Thank you very much. Back to Anissa. She just lost her internet. Oh no, she just lost her internet. So hopefully she'll <laughs> be able to retrieve it soon. So let me go ahead and introduce Dr. Lenata Warjack, who um, I've had the pleasure to know for a few years working out on Alcatraz Island and uh, such an inspiration to all of us out there um, to tell the story of the occupation. Lenita? Hi, I wanna thank everybody involved and uh, all of the guests that are here. I wish there were more of us that we could reach out to and try to get here, but I know not many people uh, are alive to be able to join us on this, but uh, Stella Leach would have been awesome if we could have been able to get her on. But we do have uh, several of the occupiers. I, and uh, Morningstar wasn't on the island, but she was definitely a part of the Red Power movement. And that's why I wanted her to share as well today. We have uh, Shirley Guevara, hopefully she's on, and I wanted her to be one of our first speakers because she doesn't have too much time uh, for this broadcast. Also, we have Claudine Boyer, who was on the island when we all came on in 89. And also, let's see, Morningstar, Shirley, Oh, Shirley, morning, Claudine. I guess there's just just us. So <laughs> I'll go ahead and uh, and oh, uh, Anissa is still trying to get on here. But uh, just a little background. Fifty years ago, plus, as students uh, from UC Berkeley and San Francisco State. Uh, I and Richard Oaks came on and uh, took the island. We were in a time and place where we felt free that we could do things. Taking our land back was a biggie as well as uh, 
bringing out the fact that we had been going through so many injustices with uh, the laws not enforced where it came to our side of getting some help, broken treaties, and also the general status of our people because we are under the federal system, which is not part of the state system. And under the federal system is control from the Department of Interior to the Bureau of Indian Affairs to tribal governments. So we're on the very bottom layer of this hierarchy and our finances and everything is pretty well controlled. So we've been in a state of poverty on top of going through the cycle of dysfunction with the boarding schools where the government passed a law to take away the children uh, and put them into Christian and government boarding schools to process and push the assimilation process. And we were the next generation where they had relocated probably 60,000 students out of the Indian schools, out of uh, the reservations and put us in the major cities in the United States. I was 18. So we were newly relocated into the Bay Area, but everything's a possibility. And, oh, Geneva, are you on? Geneva Seaboy is. So what I'd like to do is um, give uh, everyone an opportunity to speak and to introduce themselves as well. So I, I'm going to start with uh, Shirley Guevara. She was one of our young people at the time, very excited and a lot of help for our island at the time. And it's so good 50 years later that she's able to come back and join us. So Shirley, do you wanna just tell us a little bit about yourself and things that you did on the island, maybe you worked with security or in the kitchen or with the children, who knows? Tell us. There's my poster, there's my Alcatraz poster. We awesome. were living in Oakland and this poster was, we went to the Oakland Museum, their annual indoor big yard sale that they make thousands and thousands of dollars each year for the Oakland Museum. And my good friend Carmen Nez said, hey, Shirley, there's a poster right here of Alcatraz. It was only $3, so I bought it. So I got my Alcatraz poster. And then L.D. Bratt had a, a birthday party in, in the Bay Area. So we went to it and I took my poster and, and had um, her family sign up for me. So that was really an honor for them to, to sign the poster. But I forgot it when we went to Alcatraz because I could have had you all sign it when we were there, but another time. Okay, my name is Shirley Guevara. I went to Alcatraz Island uh, when I was a mere, mere child. I'm not old, I'm just in my next, um, stage of life where many of us are. I went to the island. We were going to school at Fresno State then, graduated from Ridley High School. We went, to, we went to Fresno State. So it was my sister and my two aunts and we went. My sister stayed for about a month and my two aunts stayed a little bit longer. And first thing we did was we started organizing the boats that were coming in. Um, it was like people had lived there prior to us. So trucks were running, we had running water, the toilets flushed, the big kitchens worked. It's like they had just gone away and left everything there. So we were able to use everything. So we used it for a while and then they figured, well, you know, let's cut off the electricity. So the electricity was turned off, but that was nothing new to us because we as Indian people, we always have our electricity off or we don't even have electricity. So we, we adapted to that. And then they took the water, the big barge with, with the guys of they were gonna take it and fill it up and bring it back. Yeah, right, we believe that. So then the, the barge did not come back, but there was so much support from the Bay Area. People would drive by with their boats and they would leave water for us. So they would take our containers and they would fill water for us. Um, Credence Clear Lock, Clearwater Revival donated a boat to us. So we were able to um, have that boat to get back and forth 
access to the island. And uh, Charles Steele and um, one of the quit equip boys were our, our um, boat drivers. So they were able to take people over to do what needed to happen. And then we formed um, an office so that we could receive donations and John Trudell uh, and myself and some other people went and people started dropping donations there before they would bring the donations to the island. So we had like a lot of fancy clothes, gowns, she, uh, high heels and stuff. But like Karen Harrison said, she said, oh, we utilize that stuff. We were teenagers then. So when they had dances down there at the island, we would dress up and go different outfits. And so they utilized and, and were able to use it as, as young people. So that was really great. And um, they were children. They were they were pretty young when we were there because uh, Rosalie Willie has a lot of um, Alcatraz memorabilia. So um, I I hope the kids and her family um, digitize a lot of that stuff so it it can be archived because she's she's got a lot of stuff and um, so that she can keep it for future generations and and we can look back on that. And if we haven't learned anything, we've learned that to whatever movement we've, we've been on or wherever we've gone to digitize all that information or to try to keep it and, and share it with people, not just to hold on to it and say, oh, I have it and it's mine because it's not yours because you weren't the only one. You couldn't have been there unless there were a lot of other people there as well. So, and, and those of us who were there know who the worker bees speak with the government, who could um, get our point across and... Um, we had, um, um, as Lenada mentioned, um, the doc we had a doctor there, Dr. Anthony Garcia, and um, our he held his um, medical station up in the main cell block. And uh, of course, us young ladies were always getting sick to go see Anthony at the at the, at the medical clinic there, but. Um, and then they moved it down later to the apartments and Stella Leach was there and uh, was able to help anybody that had gotten hurt or was, you know, hurt on the island. And then there was a big gym there and uh, Mad Bear Anderson would come and he would have Uweepi ceremonies and people would come and uh, we would black that out and they had a lot of ceremonies. So there was a lot of, of good medicine, good energy there on the island. And um, then we had a radio free Alcatraz. I don't know if there's any tapes of those still around that that people can view or, or have access to any of the Radio Free Alcatraz stuff. Uh, we had one baby born there, which was John Trudell's son, Wawoka. Um, but it was a good time. There was a lot of, um, then, then, then this poster, it was put on the island and we tried to get it um, brought back with Robert Free. And of course they wouldn't let us put it where it was originally because um, the birds were nesting there and the birds kind of took over that area, even though they're not really indigenous to that area. Um, the birds took precedence over the teepee and 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 um, the putting it up there, but that that's okay because we took a space across the road from there, and um, we were able to uh, participate in that. And um, uh, the medicine man um, Richard Moves Camp came and. Um, L.D. Brandt's son um, had a drone, so he would he flew out way out to the ocean and took our pictures out there, and that's uh, he 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 sent us some of that video, and so that was really nice to have to see everybody there, and it was good to see a lot of young people. So they learned about the island and these kinds of things that that need to be shared with their young people, so they know. Um, like Lenata said, don't don't be afraid to stand up what you feel is right because even if it's two or three of you, um, change needs to happen. But you can't be afraid of what other people are going to say or how they're going to look at you. And so what they look at you differently. You took a stand and you made a stand and you stood up for what you felt was right. And that that's what we try to instill in our kids is, um, you know, you want to go out on a limb for what you feel, then you need to do it. So, um, but I was there up until we, John and I had, and a couple of us had come over on that first boat. They dropped us off at the pier where our office was. And as we came over, the feds went in and took everybody off. 
So, um, and we tried to get back on, but they wouldn't let us let us get back over. So that was, we had no idea that that was going to happen. So as it was just like a regular day of work, we were coming over to do what we do in the on, in the office, and the feds went over and took over the island. So took it back, and they took all of our stuff because a lot of people had. Um, things given to us, eagle feathers, beaded moccasins, some people who came from all over to um, honor us with, with things that they had and they wanted us to have them. But the people that were there also had their medicine and their things. And what the government did was they just came room to room, threw everything, of course they picked over what they wanted, threw everything in um, blankets and hauled it off to this big warehouse. And later they told us, if you want your stuff, you need to go get it. But everything was thrown together. It would take I don't know how long if you were going to dig through all that stuff. Imagine a lot of a lot of apartments all dumped in one big room, and we were trying to figure out and go through everything, and it was terrible the way they they disrespected um, what our people had in in the movement itself. So, and I was I was a worker bee. I didn't participate in a lot of them because people always ask me how were decisions made. Well, we had a council there that that decided and the meetings would be called and we'd come up to the mess hall or the kitchen area on the, in the main cell block and um, they would ask us what we thought and what do you guys think about this and what we're going to try this and we're going to tell the government that and you know make some demands and things that that we wanted had we still been there we had we, we were, we were going to turn it into a, a Indian university with housing for our people and and it was going to be a school and Earl Livermore was working on on that um, architecture of that happening had we kept the building the, I mean the island so it, it was it was an exciting time that was the beginning of all the movements throughout um, the United States and and Canada and all over because from there it, it was like a locus it just kind of spread and opened people's eyes to see what they can do and what they can demand back and and like Lenata said we're the last rung of the ladder so to speak and but we have a voice. We have to we have to use our voice for for our people and and what we feel is right for us and for our generations to come. And um, it was a good time. It was a good learning. It helped. And here I'm retired. I worked for Oakland Unified School District from 1984 to 2016. And I said it's too expensive to live in the Bay Area, so I moved home. So I live in Dunlap, California, which is like 45 miles northeast of Fresno, below Kings Canyon National Park. And um, we have a, a home here and my daughter and, and her boyfriend and the, my grandson was living here. So we moved in with her and she said, oh my God, I thought I'd never ever live with my mother again. <laughs> but hey, it's too expensive to live in the Bay Area. So we moved home. And um, since I'm retired, I thought, oh, okay, retired life. We're so busy here with the, with the animals and the garden. And then the thing happened with uh, the fake sun dances here in Dunlap. So we were out there every morning and it's, I guess if you stand up for what you write, it never ends. You're always out there. You're always fighting for your people and trying to make change. And so we're busy. We are busy, but um, um, I'm really um, in awe of being part of of the Alcatraz Island and that movement. And I'm sorry to say I'm one of the few that are still there because a lot of our friends and a lot of our acquaintances have passed on. But um, when it's our time, we'll, we'll all have a, a good homecoming week. So um, it, it was good. And I met uh, Lenada and um, Claudine and a lot of other people there. and. Uh, I just want to say thank you to the creator for allowing us to all take part of that and to uh, still be here and to maintain, to share the word and to get the word out to everybody. Thank you. Thank you, Jody. I appreciate the overview. Uh, that was really a good presentation and I'd like to go ahead and uh, move on to the next person. I appreciate your time for this and I wanted you to be first so because I know you weren't you had other commitments so uh, thank you for that overview and if I could get uh, let's see Claudine you're there do you want to uh, talk about your time on Alcatraz and some of the things you remembered 
Claudine was a, a student at UC Berkeley at the time. And she was part of the group that uh, came on the, on the boats when we took uh, Alcatraz with the 89, 89 of us, the students and their families. So go ahead, Claudine. Thank you, uh, Lenada. Uh, yes, I did um, go to uh, school for a while at UC Berkeley. Uh, and I want to thank your, you for your participation to get me enrolled in UC Berkeley. Um, at home, um, the Bureau didn't want me to, to go to California. And I received a letter uh, stating, you know, I should uh, go to a local school, but I had already done that. But with the prejudice at the time, I was um, unable to, um, deal with the uh, prejudice. So going to Berkeley, my brother was there, um, um, my family, and it, it felt like uh, I was at home. And when I participated um, in the Alcatraz movement, um, it was a very learning experience for me and allowed me to um, get acquainted with a lot of people, uh, which was something I couldn't do at home, but uh, it was uh, a people-friendly atmosphere. It was very, very, good for me and a very good learning tool. Um, I worked in the, the kitchen for a while. I'm, I'm, as a student, I, I did what I could. Um, I was, uh, oh, on, um, on the security uh, team there. And it was good to see, greet a lot of people. It was like a, um, a communication center. And I was able to verbally talk and uh, visit with many people who shared their stories about coming to the island. Um, It was a thoroughly um, eye-opening experience for me to be there and to have shared uh, a lot of stories and the lives of the people who were there at that time and to continue on through to the present. And I thank you for this time, Lenada. Thank you. Yeah, thank you, uh, Claudine. Uh, do you want to mention some of the people that you do, that you work with, you know, just some of the people so that we could hear their names? Um, I'm... Hello? Okay, I, there was uh, another person's name on there at the moment. Um, Did you say Eleanor Lopez? Yes. Um, the Chai Biddies uh, and my friend Rosemary Whitewater. Um, we became good friends and she was, um, tending to the, the younger children. And she was a very nice person. I was, uh, it was a very special time to uh, be acquainted with someone of the same likeness that uh, 
we shared for the people and and for the upkeep of the island. Awesome. Do you want to mention anything about your experience afterwards? I mean, not in great detail, but some of the things that you did. Oh, <laughs> yeah. Um, one time on the, uh, oh, when I was at the, oh, where the dock, where they, at the loading dock, where the, we were greeting people. Um, somehow the the water shifted and i and i started falling into to the water and then lefty he he grabbed my hand and he pulled me back up and then after i got back on the the, the bridge he he said um well why didn't you scream <laughs> <laughs> and i I didn't say anything. I just smiled, you know, because it was uh, it was a different experience. I thought, oh boy, here comes the water. <laughs> but I guess that's an experience I had. Okay. Well, thank you very much for your participation and stay on. We may have some questions afterwards that you might want to answer. I want to uh, introduce Geneva Seaboy. She was a student at. Uh, San Francisco State at the time. And Geneva, are you here? I'd like you to tell us a little bit about yourself and uh, your experience on the island and some of the things that you did. Are you here? There you are. Yeah, I'm kind of got my phone. I'm using my phone, so uh, can you see me? No, can't see you. Uh, Steve, are you there? Yeah, we're not going to be able to see Geneva, unfortunately. Anissa has to uh, make her a co-host, and we lost Anissa. So oh, yeah, we'll, that's right. Oh. We'll have your voice, Geneva. You can hear me. Yeah. Can you hear me? Yes. Okay. That's good enough. You won't want to see me right now anyway. No. <laughs> 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 Actually, my activism started very young in the Chickaboard Reservation. There's a lot of issues in my area that I grew up in. Having difficulty um, hearing you. Okay. Uh, Can hear you now. Just set your phone down and then just. No. I have to hold it closer. Can you hear me? Yes. If you set your phone down, it'll stabilize it and then just speak into your phone. Well, I did have it uh, laying down. Well, I actually, growing up in high school. I think one of the major activisms that I did. It was in high school. Um, you know, they had FA, FFA, uh, Future Farmers of America, they had all kinds of these little organizations students come um, uh, sign up and, and belong to. Um, so, so, some kids went and we asked the people. We'd like to have an Indian club. And my God, he went into a tizzy. He was hollering and saying, no, 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 without any you know, explanation as to why or what. Well, I said, then we're going to walk out. And then he said, well, sign these papers first, which was um, um, dropping out of the high school. And I just told everybody, don't sign anything, because the girls were all going to sign it. So we walked down and we went to the uh, Ben Camp Community Action Program offices and told them about it. And so they, uh, um, they uh, got together with the, had a meeting, called for a meeting with the, the superintendent and the principal and other officials, council counselors, and us girls and, and those people that worked at the camp office. Well, no, we didn't get our uh, 
Indian club that year. But you know, I, after a year I graduated, which was the following year, they started Indian club. <laughs> so can you hear me? Yes. Okay. Not too good, talking. but we can hear you. Okay. Well, here. Um, so, after graduation, I started my first year at uh, college, and I wasn't too impressed. With it. And I need, I just wanted to leave the reservation, so I told my mom about it, and she helped me get out to San Francisco, where my brother. One of my brothers was out there already, um, on the Indian Movies program. So I was out there and um, I started babysitting for people that they knew. I was in the state, Al and um, Richard. Um, Hello, can't hear you. Hello, Stephen, are you there? Geneva? I'm, I'm here, Lenada, but uh, yeah, it looks like we lost her. Technical difficulties, we lost yeah, her. Yeah, it looks that way. Um, Lenada, down, down below, there's a question and answer box. So, yeah, I, I see that uh, okay. in the chat. Just, yeah, I just wanted to point that out that there's a Q&A box. Okay, so you, anyone out there can go ahead and start asking questions, but uh, right now, since we lost Geneva, I'd like to go ahead and have uh, Morningstar uh, kind of give her introduction and an overview and uh, say about if, if, if you could uh, synthesize it down to maybe about 15 minutes. Yeah. Are you um, can you hear me? Oh, here's Geneva. It, it, we're having really difficulty hearing you. Uh, maybe if you hold your phone not too close to your mouth. Okay, go ahead. Oh, we lost her again. I can go and then if she's able to, to get on. Um, she can come on after you. For sure. Okay, Stephen, could you make sure that she doesn't come on during the time that Morningstar is talking? Yeah, An Anissa would have to do that. She's the one with all the video uh, capability. They're, they're hosting the webinar. I'm on just like you are. Oh, gosh. Yeah. <laughs> Can you hear me now and back on? Geneva, if you could wait a few minutes, uh, we'll wait for Anissa to come on. She's still trying to get her uh, information, I mean, her system on. But if you could wait, we'll go ahead with Morningstar and then you could say, uh, you can talk after Morningstar. Yeah, I do wanna speak about um, my role and women's role too. We can't hear okay, you, Geneva. Okay. Geneva, so could okay. you wait until after morning star and then hopefully Anissa will be back because she has all the controls. Okay? Okay. Thank you. Yeah. Go ahead, morning star. Good afternoon. My name is Morning Star Galley. I am a Jamawi band of Pitt River. And I just want to say thank you to Laneda and to everyone that was a part of organizing this and and had us on. Um, thank you to Auntie Shirley. She had about 20 minutes of notice before she jumped on uh, this morning. So thank you for always being a trooper and getting on. Um, my tribe is Ajumawi Band of Pitt River and I was born and raised in Oakland, California. As Lenita mentioned, um, I was, I'm was i not an Alcatraz veteran. I was not born yet during the occupation. Um, I was born about 10 years later, but I have very much been raised um, in um, 
in you know the the following um, years of the red power movement, and um, am still doing work that is a continuation of that struggle. So I was born in Oakland, California, at the Aim for Freedom Survival School that was run by Bill Wabapa, and the the Aim for Freedom Survival School was also known as the Oakland Aim House, and um, it was at a time about 10 years after the occupation where Bill Wabapa was holding sunrise gatherings as a commemoration to the occupation and to the veterans and a way that during Indigenous Peoples Day and during Indigenous Peoples Thanksgiving that we were in remembrance of the time of the occupation and the anniversary. And so those events still continue today through the sunrise gatherings that are held twice a year in, in October and November. Um, my own tribe had their occupation a year following the Alcatraz um, occupation. And so this coming year will be the 50th anniversary of the Pitt River land claims and of the occupation that was held in the Four Corners territory. And so um, we are discussing what the commemoration events will look like this coming year and um, you know, how, how to, um, as tribal members to support those efforts. I think something that's not really mentioned, um, you know, that not that I've heard too much is that um, the California Indian leaders that were taken as, as prisoner and held on the island um, that were held on Alcatraz. And so when I was working for my tribe as the tribal historical preservation officer, I found this document that stated that in February of 1864, Starr and his detachments were on the field on various scouts to capture Mill Creek Indians. Starr had been ordered to capture their leaders and send them to Alcatraz for confinement. In August 1864, Captain James Darty, then in command of Camp Bidwell and 21 men, marched up to Chico and Humboldt Road between Chico and Butte and then to Deer Creek Meadows to enlist Hiram Good as a guide, one of the best Indian hunters in the country. And so this is information, you know, that as California Native peoples that through, um, you know, the, through what happened during the gold rush and the gold greed and genocide that occurred at the time. And, you know, a hundred years later when the occupation of the island occurred um, by our relatives, that this is uh, a continued history. And so, um, you know, I've, I've um, worked to help to organize the sunrise gatherings over the past 12 years or so now. Um, I attended Hintel Kuka where Auntie Shirley taught for many decades. Um, the Little Red Schoolhouse that started on the island during the occupation was moved to Oakland, California um, and, and was moved to become Hintel Kuka. And so I was raised by um, the, not only the occupiers of, of the island, but many of the students that um, participated at the time. And so these were our educators, these were our instructors, um, you know, we learned about the history of the occupation and um, that poster that Auntie Shirley had in, in her background, that was the poster that I really um, vividly remember growing up in my home, that that, that um, poster was on the wall of our house. And so have now raised my children, you know, to attend, um, not only attend the sunrise gatherings, but really learn about the history um, of the past 50 years and understand that there is this indigenous resistance movement that continues through the red power movement. And so we have many um, fights and battles ahead as, as Auntie had mentioned, um, you know, that there was this, um, there was this fake ceremony that took place on her land only a mile down from her land a couple of weeks ago. And so gathering our relatives together to go and address that, um, you know, is, is another way and just another continuation of 
of ensuring that um, the respect is shown um, to do these things in a proper way, that um, you know, there is a recognition of, of the history and recognition of the indigenous women leaders that were all a part of this island and a part of this history. And so the way that that continues in our battles to protect our sacred places and our battle to protect our ceremonies um, and to just uphold our, our way of life as Indian peoples. And so I will stop there and just say thank you again. And it's an honor to be on here. Thank you, Morning Star. I really appreciate uh, your ongoing efforts to continue the struggle and and the fighting. It's just uh, it's just an ongoing battle. I I know we're we're all involved in that continuously. Here we are, fifty years later. But uh, I'm going to check to see if we have uh, Geneva Seaboy, if she's available to talk and say a few words about coming to San Francisco and be on Alcatraz and what she did on the island. Geneva, are you here with us? Can you hear me now? A little. No. It's, it's not clear, you know, because your voice kind of turns into a sound. Hmm. But I'm uh, sorry, the video, but it says I can't. Well, I'll just sit and listen, but... Um, no, go ahead and say, uh, finish your, your presentation. Okay. Well, then, like I was saying, I started meeting all these people in the uh, ones from the San Francisco State, and then um, the November 20th was planned, and so we got all together. And a lot of the people of the A9 people, you know, there wasn't too many I knew, I'd never met before, but got to know them later on. And um, it was exciting the first night and scary because, you know, we didn't, we didn't know what was going to happen. And um, anyway, when the embargo lifted, people were coming on, uh, Gail Treppel and I were on the dock meeting people. And we had a type, we found the typewriter there, which is now the bathroom. Uh, and we started taking names down of all the people that were coming on, uh, the people that were there, where, the, where they were from, the, what tribe they were from. And the noises started coming in. And so we started uh, helping with um, organizing the, the types of organ. Uh, donations that went to food, clothing, other things. Um, some of this was ridiculous, <laughs> but you know what? I got a pair of, um, I brought a pair of hair ties that were made of um, mink, full mink. <laughs> so I was able to use that. But a lot of women, we all did our share in what we could do. Um, cooking, uh, setting up the programs like this education, uh, the medical, that was all very good. And security, you know for security's sake. And we formed committees and uh, it was really an organized, we started getting organized, we were organized really good. And I was on the um, public relations with Grace Store Committee. So we worked a lot with those people, uh, all the people that were coming on. And after I left there, I finished my school in social work and behavioral sciences and a minor in psychology and uh, addiction counseling. And as a social worker, I guess I spent most of my life always advocating for people and services. So, you know, everybody there helped out really great. And so my activism kept, you know, kept on. And, and I have the ability to speak up, you know, and not that back down from people. And that was pretty much an um, exciting time of my life. I think that was the best part of my life that I have to say. Because it taught me a lot. I learned a lot just from you, Lanita, uh, Richard, his outstanding speaking. Um, um, he had a lot of advice. And, you know, people on Medicare, we became close. So that I think that's about all I need to say right now. Okay, good, because uh, we could hear you. Okay. <laughs> and I remember Shirley and her, her sister coming out, and I was like, Wow, there's monos. 
Okay. Well, well you know, I, uh, we, were gonna, we were gonna have Johnny Bear Cub uh, come out, but there was a death in her family. Did you get that yeah. email? Yeah. Can you find it? Because she talked about the people to be sure and mention, and I can't find that right now, but she did mention uh, Linda Mankiller. She was, yeah. she was out on the island and probably, I mean, I saw Wilma out there with her kids maybe a couple of times visiting on the weekend, but she never stayed. And I know that Wilma has been given a lot of credit, but uh, actually it was her sister and her brother was on Alcatraz. Mm -hmm. and then, Wilma did a lot. Wilma did a lot for her her people or her tribe. Yeah, she did, and um, she was totally inspired by Alcatraz. But I was thinking yeah. about the people that were actually there. Yeah, um, she mentioned uh, Eleanor Lopez. Yes, um, and Bill, so Eleanor she, and Bill. Yeah, and Eleanor was uh, was a volunteer cook. She cooked most of the time. Um, Oh, I'm trying to think. She mentioned Shirley. Or, how do you pronounce your last name, Shirley? Guerra? Guerra, like Che Guevara. Okay. Like Che Guevara? Che Guevara. Like che Guevara. Yeah. Also, Guevara. Um, also in the kitchen was Manny. Manny could organize that kitchen. Oh, yeah. With, I remember Claudine and the, worked in the kitchen. And, yes. Um, yeah. He could and he cooked for the army so he could make a meal out of anything he threw together <laughs> anything, yeah. and then there was yeah. jim vaughn remember jim vaughn jim vaughn yeah. was on the yeah. Yeah. and also um linda and her son and her brother richard and her sister vanessa they were all there uh, right. bob tishkai bob tishkai yeah. um yes um my aunt uh, gladys and julie dick and uh, Gladys brought home Jake McKinney, and he's still with her after 50 years. Wow. They live right next wow. door. Congratulations. They live right next, <laughs> they live right next door to us. So, you know, he's, he's still kicking. And um, the school, Linda Arenado was, you know, instrumental in starting the school on top of the, um, the apartment buildings up there. So uh, the kids weren't running them up. They were learning something, and, and she was teaching them. So um and also security you know that that was that was real good and it was um uh, it was good to go back um for the 50 reunion and see everybody and of course everybody was claiming um, i saw you <laughs> yeah but she mentioned uh johnny also mentioned um a judy uh village center i remember the name after she oh, yeah. I mentioned that um k hair mini horses yeah, there you go. There's another one. Yep. Um, John Martel. Um, oh, Ross yeah. Harden. Yeah. Ross Harden. Ross Harden. Yep. And uh, she, Gerald Sam. No, I don't even know if he, she's dead or alive yet. <laughs> Does anybody know if he's still alive? No, he's gone. Gerald Sam? Yeah. Oh, really? Yeah, most, most of that, most of them are gone. Bernal Blindman. Yeah, he's gone. Joe Bill. He's, I don't know about Joe Bill. He's a sneaky one. He may still be alive in Alaska somewhere. <laughs> Joe, Joe Bill's like a cat. He's got nine lives. Yep. <laughs> Judy Scraper, she was from Oklahoma. Judy Scraper, yeah. Judy Scraper. And Grace Thorpe was there and very instrumental and helpful with her daughter, Dagmar, and Luchadell, John's wife. Um, there were many uh, women who were very instrumental in maintaining the island. And then I, I just wanted to correct you momentarily on... Uh, you mentioned uh, our infirmary. It wasn't uh, Dr. Anthony Garcia. He was still a student then at that time at Berkeley, but 
His name was Dr. Tepper. That was uh, Stella's boss, Stella Leach. She was a RN, a nurse in his office. So they just brought their whole uh, office there on the island. And then after he left, then she stayed, of course, with her family and continued the having uh, the infirmary there. But she was very helpful because she was a, an older lady. She was in her 50s, at least. Of course, that's young for us nowadays, but... <laughs> But Stella was there and uh, she, she did really good work out there in helping to orchestrate and coordinate all the activities that were going on. And then- uh, Someone asked- Yeah. Someone asked about, um, somebody asked about where the Little Red Schoolhouse moved to. The Little Red Schoolhouse, after they left Alcatraz, they went to the uh, Friendship House. And then from the Friendship House, they moved down to, um, where the Spanish speaking unity council is there. And then from there, it, it grew too big because there were so many native peoples that wanted uh, to see native peoples and to work with them and to teach what they knew, their crafts and their language and whatever they had to teach the young people. We went to the board of directors um, with Oakland Unified School District. And at that time we had three areas we were to choose from. And our native peoples looked at two areas, which were in the flatlands. And we looked at one up by Merritt College, we're in the hills. And we chose the one in the college, up by Merritt College, which was in the trees that looked like we weren't even in the city. And that was called Hintel Kayuka. And the reason we got that name was because of Essie Parrish, who was our spiritual leader of the Pomo people. She um, walked through it and gave her her blessings and that's the name she gave us, which means um, house of little people because they didn't have word for children. So that's what that means for um, California Indian school. And it's still there. I'm, I mean, I worked there from 2016 to, I mean, 20, 1984 to 2016, it's still there. Of course, with the budgets, the way they are with the state, a lot of our people don't qualify anymore because if you make 25 cents or 50 cents over the, the limit, then um, you can no longer be there. But we are very fortunate to have a, a site administrator at that time. Her name was Barbara Juno. She did whatever she could to make sure our native people stayed in that in that school and Morningstar and all these kids now who were adults went there and they're all um, they're all pretty smart kids and they they know their rights. We try to teach them their rights and don't let the non-native schools tell you any different because. A lot of our kids excel academically. Um, a lot of them went to high school, graduated, and went on to college. So we're we're very um, proud of our school. So there's it's still open. Of course, our numbers are low, uh, but we're still there. We're still maintaining. So I don't know how much longer we'll be there, but uh, we gave it our all. Thank you, Shirley. I know that. What you're talking about has been replicated all across the country for Native people. And even within our own tribes now, you know, we're trying to make sure that they have classes on the languages, the history, the culture, and as much information as we could give them. So that whole thing replicated itself throughout. And then of course, Native American studies, because, uh, you know, I was with uh, the Third World Strike at Berkeley where we initiated ethnic studies. And here we are 50 years later, and we, we're still having difficulties. And of course, it's always finances and, you know, being able to get the right people in to, who can teach you know, the history and the culture by telling the truth. And I guess that's always been the problem is not being able to get the truth out, the truth about our genocide, the history, what happened to our people. And of course, California was a site where just millions of natives were just totally annihilated. And so you're one of the survivors. We're all <laughs> surviving from, from our tribes and from where we're at in our country. And we're just continuing on, you know, what we did at Alcatraz and we're having to work harder. And uh, we're just reaching a point where uh, the youth are coming back. And we, you know, it was so exciting when I was in at Standing Rock, I ran into, uh, 
uh, Fawn Oaks and her son Elijah and of course Eloy and uh, some of the Pitt River folks. It was just, you know, I was able to see the sons and daughters of those that were on Alcatraz that were part of the leadership and from Pitt River, uh, the gal down in Los Angeles, like oh God, Victoria, I can't think of her name, but you know, it was so good to see everyone there and yeah. still carrying out that. Yeah. So from there to Standing Rock, and now we see Black Lives Matter, and we're still fighting the same racism and discrimination that we've been fighting for years, but we were 50 years early. <laughs> And now it's come yeah, full it's circle. Just like, it's just like Colin Kaepernick. He was the first one to kneel and stand up for what his rights were and, and for his native people and his indigenous nation. And then he was ostracized, kicked out of football. And now I watched on TV the other day, the NBA, all of them held arms in unison and they all knelt down. Just like the movement, Colin Kaepernick was ahead of his time and he still doesn't have a job. Go yeah, Colin. but he's got millions of dollars of endorsements, so I don't think he's <laughs> in any bad. He don't need a job. Yeah, he doesn't <laughs> need a job. But I mean, he stood up for his rights, and he, you know, he went against the whole um, the whole football team, and he he stood, and he knew what was going to happen. But you know, yeah. without money, you, you, you still and stand came, up for what you think is right. It came full circle because then he came out to Alcatraz, and like we're we're yeah. kind of the symbol of the spirit of resistance for a lot of people because a lot of people, uh, especially in, I know in the Bay Area before we even got there as relocated natives into the Bay Area from our homelands, um, they had been fighting there against all the oppression that they've been living under too. So, you know, we, we brought it out with uh, with what we did on the island and our stand to take our land back and for all the injustices and you were all a part of it. And that's, it's uh, really an amazing uh, time even now to just having to continue on but understanding and knowing what's going on around the country as well. But uh, I think we're going to be open for questions if you could stay, Shirley, or any, all of you, for any questions that might be coming up out there. I'd really like to uh, be able to answer that with uh, the people that we have here. I see one. Thank you for starting the fire decades ago and still feeding it in our hard times for indigenous and natural people worldwide. Merit from Poland. Wow. Hi, uh, Lineda. If you look over next to the chat, there's a Q&A. And there are 14, 15 questions people have um, posted in there. Would you like me to filter some of them and just ask? Yes, could you? Because I can't see it. I've just got, I've, I have chat, but I don't have the questions. Okay, so uh, one anonymous attendee asks, how did different tribal norms and traditions govern together while on the island during the occupation? Okay, I'd like to take a quick shot at that. The thing is, is we were being assimilated with our identities taken away as native indigenous people. And when we took the island, it brought that all back that we had to go back and learn our culture, our traditions, our history. And this was just the very beginning of it. So in a sense, it awakened our spiritual consciousness so that we could go back to the values and the culture that we once knew and enjoyed, but bringing it up to date and still continuing that effort. So there was a big, I would say, alignment, not only spiritually and politically and socially, there were so many uh, alignments that happened at that time and that still continue. Does anyone else wanna add some comments to that? I think we all had 
I think we all had that spirituality in us because we as Indian people always know who to pray to and who our creator is. And when, when we need to, we pray, but when we kind of put it on the back burner, so to speak, because we're trying to go to school, get our education, um, do what's expected of us. But then when we hit Alcatraz, it's like all of it was renewed. We renewed all of that. And all of our Indian people who came together help us see that and help us really now really get into our, our culture and to pray and to have ceremonies and to learn from each other. We learn so much from each other. And we see the differences, but yet there's a lot of similarities. So it was good for all of us to come and learn because we truly were Indians of all tribes and we learned from one another and our, and it was a renewal of all our medicine, all our spirit and all our, our, our prayers. Yes, thank you. That's very good. Okay, does anyone else wanna make a comment on that? Okay, do we have another question, Steve? Yeah, from uh, Regina Islas, uh, she asks, what do you feel the impact of the takeover has been over time? And do you see it as connected with the uprisings on the pipeline? Okay, I think, you know, it's kind of not only on the spiritual level, but also our spirit of resistance because of the genocide in the boarding schools and the assimilation into this and the things that were happening to us, I think that uh, it awakened a, a large resistance. And, and uh, the difference though, between say our, our protests and non-native protests is we, we always stay nonviolent and I see where violence breaks out when it's the non-natives, but we, you know, we have to try to keep it non-violent and very spiritual and maintain those prayers because those prayers are our strength and that's what helps us move into the next phase. So um, I think it still go, it goes on. We've been fighting a long time, but even before Alcatraz, our people were fighting, so that spirit of resistance continues and which reminds me i wrote a book called native resistance that i just published in november and although san francisco public schools hasn't supported really supported on me on that book um i just want to mention it and that it's available at my website drwarjack.com so if you want a copy of that book, I try to get in as much as I could, but I think many of us need to start writing, those of us that are, we're not kicked back, but we are in retirement. And I think it's time that we started getting our stories out and getting them shared. Anybody else? Does anyone want to comment on that question? I'll just add that I know when I had first arrived at Standing Rock um, in September 2016 that Lineda was one of the first people that I saw there and so it was <laughs> just really beautiful to be a part of that and and to see you know how all of our our aunties and our elders are still right there on the front line standing with the next generations. Thank you. Thank you. Yes, it was great to see everybody, wasn't it? Then that we had the California tent that we all went to and, and visiting all the other nations. It was really an awesome experience and it was good to see you there too, Morningstar. Okay, do we have another question? This one's also from an anonymous attendee. How did gender affect individual experiences on the island during the occupation? I think that women are always the worker bees. <laughs> I don't think we had to think about it. You know, we just went about and did what we needed to do. Of course, the press and the media on the other end, they only wanted to talk to the men and, you know, we experienced that whole discrimination factor through the media when it came to, you know, being able to talk about 
uh, our reservations or what happened to us. Uh, there wasn't uh, much given to us in terms of media representation, but in, in our tradition, the male and the female is what makes the balance. So you always have to have a balance of both male and female. It's uh, what we call, what is called the matriarchy. And in present day, of course, we live in the patriarchy, which is the hierarchy of oppression. And we're at the very bottom of that. But in the matriarchy, it's circular. And we, everything is shared which was how we organized our traditional governments based upon our geographic ecosystem and the plants and the animals that were found in the medicines and our clan uh, symbols and uh, our recognition was through our uh, geographic environment. So, you know, it's just kind of understood in, in native world, those that know their culture and their tradition that we always strive for that balance. It's not male over female or female over male. It's the balance that we always seek. Does anyone wanna talk about that? Well, they always, they, they, they always choose the man Yep. But it's the woman that's behind the man. Where they're <laughs> braiding their hair, making sure they look good for the cameras, and uh, it's always the woman that's the back. You know they're going to run things by us. <laughs> yeah, but we knew everything going on. <laughs> <laughs> that's really true, and like I know I really had to, I ran into that, that patriarchy and the discrimination and employment and just, you know, throughout, you know, my lifetime, but I know that they did uh, only recognize the men and really supported the patriarchy to that extent. So uh, we just need to try to continue to work for the balance. And that's why we're having this presentation and having the women's voice today because you never really got to hear that when we were on Alcatraz. And unfortunately it's 50 years later and we're trying to remember everything, you know? <laughs> but uh, I think it's really awesome for all of you to come out and, and be a part of this today and we'll try to get something more together Hopefully, Steve, right? Later on? Yes, hopefully. Okay, yes, do we absolutely. have any, any more questions? Oh, we have a bunch. Um, okay, go for it. Uh, Amanda Moran writes, thank you elders for your efforts to reclaim indigenous land. As a child growing up in the Bay and hearing about the occupation, I was inspired. Uh, what suggestions might you have for white allies in supporting local indigenous communities today? And, and she has a follow-up. I'm also seeing a lot of indigenous youth on TikTok. Would any of you share your stories about Alcatraz on this medium to reach the youth? Well, you know, we're not uh, really technology savvy. We didn't even have cell phones 50 years ago, okay? And it's it's a little difficult getting into the new applications and I'm just happy to see everybody on Zoom today. And so it's, it's difficult getting on uh, other mediums, media mediums, but we do have younger people. And if we have a question, we have to ask them when it comes to our technology, but they're doing things themselves. And I know like from my reservation and our tribes, uh, we, we're trying to do as much as we can for the youth. And anybody want to talk about that? Yeah, I'd, I'd just like to say we, have, we had a young man at Hintel. His name is Chapter Gul Karina Sun. And as a child, he was always writing stories so then as he was writing stories, he decided he wanted to make a movie. So he made this little movie out of his little whatever camera things he had. 
and he showed it at one of our parent meetings. Then he goes into uh, junior high, then he goes to high school, and he's made two movies that have shown at um, Grand Lake Theater. Wow. So Chapta's really, he's, he's really into the movies and I did. I haven't seen him yet. I asked his mom for the link, or maybe I'll go to see if it's on Amazon or something. And but um, um, so our young people are well versed in all of this technology. Uh, my grandson, who's ten, he says, "Grandma, I'll show you how to." I just got a new phone because my other phone finally blinked out. I had a flip phone for I don't know how long. <laughs> but as you were talking about getting on Zoom and doing all of this stuff, we still live in an area here in Fresno County that have no electricity or running water. So it's really, it's tough for our people to even get on Zoom or to have technology unless they're in the classroom. And then they, our kids pick it up and they learn it very quickly. But um, there are areas where, where I'm, I'm glad I'm still able to stay on because my um, internet is iffy up here in the mountains. We're not like we're in town. We have Xfinity and we can stay on for days. We can't. When, no. our, when our internet goes low, it, it's slow, but kids, kids know it all. Yep, that's really true. And I really appreciate that. I Fortunately, my daughter is running the, the youth program out to our tribes and she did a whole a whole series of interviews with uh, instructors and teachers and language speakers learning the history and the culture and uh, it was for the uh, the work uh, children employed during the summer and uh, so they had they listened to all of that and uh, we were able to get star presenters to talk to us. Uh, she was able to get Adam Beach to talk about uh, the movies and he really did an awesome job. And also Lance Morgan with Ho-Chunk Inc. who developed the whole business plan outside of the tribes for homes, for housing, for everything. So they were able to prosper in that way, but just having the opportunity to talk to the people who have done things and people who are knowledgeable about the history and the culture. And so I know we're making a big effort towards that. And my daughter has been involved in a lot of that. So I'm, I'm really proud of her because um, she has, she's gaining a lot of knowledge in helping and of course she helps me all the time with technology. <laughs> so do we have anyone else that wants to say anything about it? Okay, next question. All right, uh, Alison Crapo is curious about your daily lives today and what you're fighting for now. Our daily lives today are pretty much the way that it was. We've gone a little bit further. And one of the good things about Alcatraz, it ended the termination era. So we're, you know, started in this whole self-determination era. And we were able to get the attention of President Nixon at the time, who was the first and only president that ever did anything for us. He, you know, doubled the budgets to the reservations. He uh, initiated positive legislation. And uh, now we're kind of going back in a political sense. It's going backwards. But uh, I know I'm, I'm retired right now, but being retired only means you work harder for nothing. <laughs> I mean, for no salary, but... <laughs> <laughs> but it's to advance your, your, you know, the culture and, and the knowledge as much as possible. So does somebody want to say something about what they're doing today? Or how was that question posed, Steve? Yeah, it's, uh, I guess I'm curious about your daily lives today and what you fight for now. 
<laughs> we're still fighting. It just gets harder. Yeah, for me. Yeah, for me, I we we have a, a tribal council down at Banamono Indians has a tribal council, and I'm the vice chair on that tribal council, and it's like Indian politics are totally unnecessary we just need to move on and keep your personalities out of it and quit trying to be um like those men on alcatraz who want to run the show but they don't want to listen to the women uh, <laughs> that's the hardest part of me. still going on we we, we just want to um do a b and c and get it done and move on to the next A, B, C, and D. We don't need all these roadblocks that uh, we're asking and trying to work together and to come to a common cause. We don't want to, we just want to be direct. We don't want to go around it around about way, but that's the most uh, hardest thing for me right now is, is cause I don't play, I don't play politics. Yeah. I'm straightforward, say what I have, that's it. If it hurts your feelings, then I'm sorry, but that's just the way it is. We want to move on and get this thing done because we're not federally recognized yet. We're in that federal recognition process. And even though we have trust land, we have our Indian land, we still have to jump through this hoop because of the United States government. But right. we're working towards that. And that's that's the most ridiculous thing that, that they're, they're making us do. But you know what? That's what we're working on. So that's, uh, and I'm the chair of the research committee. So we're in the process of, of getting, compiling all our information and uh, getting our legal help. And uh, our unambiguous petition has been written. So we're lacking areas between 1950 to 1980. So those are the areas we're trying to research. And that's all we're trying to do, get that part done and give it to somebody to write it and we can move on. We don't need all these roadblocks thrown in our way to try to do our job. And that's, that's, and then I sew, I'm, I, I do a lot of sewing. Uh, we have crafts, we have crafts. My daughter, we bead, um, we have, uh, we, we uh, make little moccasins, uh, not baby moccasins, but little moccasins you can hang in your window. We, we try to uh, take our crafts because a lot of people around this area um, want to see a lot more Native American stuff and for Native Americans to get involved. And so we've joined uh, non-Native groups just to get our awareness out there to show that we are interested in what you're doing and vice versa. They're interested in what we're doing and they're looking at us differently. And um, we're looking at them differently when we were protesting against the fake Sundance that was held out here on Matt Downer Ranch, when we were growing up as kids, all we saw were redneck white ranchers, cowboy hats, guns in the window. But when we were doing the protest, all of those ranchers were so supportive to us they brought us snacks. They said, do you guys need water? One of them was a Vietnam vet. He said, you know what? You, you girls shouldn't be out here by yourselves. You know, it's there's a lot of people that don't agree with what's going on. And, and you know what? I'm going to run to the store real quick and I'm going to come back and check on you girls. And we got so much high fives and, and um, fist bumps and everything from a lot of the non-natives. Our people came out, but the support was from all those ranchers and it was just totally awesome. So um, that was a surprise to me because I grew up here until I graduated from high school and then I moved to the Bay Area. But to come back and to, to see that support from, from people we grew up with whose parents were the racist rednecks, cowboy hat gun hanging in your window kind of guys but these these guys we got a lot of good support from them mm -hmm. and so that was that was the that was the best part of of uh seeing all of that with the fake sundance well uh that's really an awesome comment because you know we are dealing with that issue internally and externally so while we have to deal with personalities and just trying to get the business done, you know, we have to deal with our inside matters and try to resolve 
the external matters on the outside, like Shirley just explained, and a lot of it is, say, for example, Standing Rock was a good example of uh, people coming together to support justice for Native tribes and clean water. Water is life. I mean, that's what we're all fighting for today. We had our part in there and we did as much as we can, but this isn't just our fight. This is everybody's because we got the environment and all of the laws that are hurting the plants and the animals, the children, the migration, uh, not the migration, but the, they call them the migrant children, which are our indigenous children on the Mexico side. We never divided that country, but there are our own people that are being put into jails and uh, separated, the family separated. So we're still dealing with that as well as through the welfare system, say in South Dakota, they still take the children and sending them out east, even though we have the, the Indian Child Welfare Act, which is neglected, you know, because trying to get laws enforced that support us has always been difficult. And those are kind of the things that we're still running into, you know, but mainly things are affecting everybody now. And that's why it's everybody's, everybody's fight now. They just need to make themselves knowledgeable about what's going on with the plants, the animals, the water, the air, the earth, you know, everything that is hurting us and destroying us because with this worldwide pandemic, it's, it's not going to be easy. People have to do their part. And then we've got this great big part in America that are still so anti-Native and racist and discriminatory. Of course, they're just hurting themselves by not wearing masks. But, uh, you know, we've all got this. We've got to unify and try to put our struggles together and look for the, our prayers and our leadership. Thank you, Lenada. Uh, that's a great place to end. We've reached 1230. And uh, I want to thank you and, and all of the panelists for joining us and all of the attendees for joining us. And uh, have a great weekend. Okay, thank you, Steve. Thanks, everybody. Thank you. Thank you. Love you. Take care. Take care. See ya. See ya. <laughs> Bye. See ya. All right.